Okay. Is it working now? Sorry about that. The the chat function wasn't working for me, so if anybody could write something in the chat function, that would help so I can make sure that works. Because without that, there wouldn't be much point to doing this whole live stream. Please somebody write something. Okay, hello. That is good news. It wasn't working. It was telling, it said not working. Um, and I have no idea why. And refreshing the page killed the live stream. So hopefully some people find their way over here. I changed, changed the announcement. Um, but it could be a little bit. Uh, that said, at least they can watch it later. Um, so that stinks. But... Those are going to be some of the realities of trying to do this online. So um, I've got a few thoughts for this. I'm going to, one of the things I'm going to do during the live streams is I'm going to go through um, the slides that I usually cover. I don't think I can show them to you. I don't know how to do a screen share with this. I'll, I'll try to learn a lot more tools as time goes on. Let me see if there's anything there. Yeah, I don't, don't see anything with that. But um but I can at least go through them, and uh, I can I can just make sure I, I at least briefly touch on the the uh, points that I normally hit in class, and and then on top of that, um, you know I, I mostly want to answer your questions that you guys have. I, I gave you some videos that are relevant. Uh, of course, you know your textbooks. I can't tell you specific pages because I don't know which textbooks you're using. But um, just to be clear, is everything is everything coming through okay? Is the video quality all right and the sound? Am I choppy or anything? Give me some feedback if you can. We're good. All good. Okay. Hot diggity. In that case. I will uh, go through. So hopefully you have the exam three review. We're not going to have exam three for a little bit. That will be uh, probably online. It, it'll be after we get done with the plants and photosynthesis and stuff. Um, so not not quite yet. But uh, it will come up fairly soon. Um, just so we have some time before exam four as well. These exams, like I said, you're going to be able to use your books. You're going to be able to use your notes, uh, just not other people, uh, especially people in the class, but no no other people taking the exam. I'm, I'm being pretty uh, liberal about about what you're allowed to use. So just, uh, you know, cheating is still still a thing, even though I'm I'm making it so you can do a lot of things that normally would be cheating, like use your notes and use your book. Okay, so... Um, hopefully you have that review though, and, and you have the links to the videos that are important for this week and go, go through those and try to understand them really well. But, uh, all right. So I want to get back to tree thinking real quick. So last week we were looking at phylogenetic trees. I'm going to draw a couple of trees on here. Okay, so I've got these two trees, and and one of the things I would want you to be able to do is determine the story that the tree tells. Like for one, one thing is like, are these two trees telling the same story or a different story? And and my hope is that you could study these out and determine that they are actually telling the same story, uh, even though they look different. That I've I've got uh, some sort of 
ancestral population that at some point had a split and one of the lineages eventually became what I'm calling species C and the other eventually became species A and B. And, and then if I follow the split that went down towards A and B, eventually there was another split and one of, one of the lineages eventually became A and the other eventually became B. Uh, I would hope that you would know that all these lines depict generations and generations of common ancestors uh, that are shared either between all of them or just between the what are now C or just by A and B and then and then those splits. I would expect you to be able to figure out who the closest relatives are and and identify uh, monophyletic groups. Um, remind me, I did go through monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic already. Is that correct? If you could chat me that, that'd be super helpful. You're leaving me hanging. Yep, okay, good news. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just go over those very, very briefly then. So a monophyletic group is really useful because uh, that is a common ancestor and then all of its descendants. And these are really useful groups because like, like is the case with coronavirus, I mean, the first thing that they're going to do when they discover something like coronavirus is they're going to sequence its uh, genetics and figure out where it fits into the monophyletic, well, into the uh, uh, phyletic tree, the, the uh, phylogenetic tree of life and especially of viruses that we know of. And, and so we would see where it fits. And because of what we know about its close relatives, we would suddenly know a whole lot about it. So these monophyletic groups and knowing which monophyletic groups pertain to a given organism, that is really, really valuable. It teaches us a lot about organisms that we didn't know before. And so once again, that's a common ancestor in all of its descendants. Sometimes uh, we'll find a group that we just think is too weird. Uh, a good example of this would be like birds. Uh, the closest relatives of birds are crocodiles and the closest relatives of well, crocodilians and the closest relatives of crocodilians are birds. Um, but a lot of times people will take a group that they think crocodilians should be part of. Uh, they usually call them reptiles. And, and in that group, they also think things like snakes and lizards, those belong. And, and, and turtles, these are all good. Well, none of these things are as closely related to crocodilians as birds are to crocodilians. And so if I was going to create a monophyletic group that includes snakes and lizards and crocodiles, I would have to include the birds. But a lot of times people are like, no, the birds are just too weird because they fly around and they got feathers and whatnot. And, and they just want to kick them out of that group. And, and what they have created when they do this is it's called a paraphyletic group. It's a common ancestor and some, but not all of the descendants. And, and essentially what's going on there is because I'm kicking the birds out, really without due cause, because they're smack dab in the middle of that group, I'm just missing out on a lot of knowledge I could have had about the group, uh, a lot I could have known about birds, and a lot I could have known about the other reptiles because of what I know about birds, and there's really no good reason to do it other than I just don't feel comfortable calling birds reptiles. So reptiles without birds, that's a paraphyletic group, which is, uh, it's garbage, right? Because I've just taken knowledge and I've thrown it away. So the worst though that you could do, you could also just form a group based on things that they have in common, like uh, stuff that I consider to be creepy crawly. You know, I could have uh, centipedes in there and snakes and slugs and earthworms and uh, octopus. Right, and and this can be my group, you know, creepy crawly things, and, and uh, I would not really be paying any attention at all to their relatedness. And if I knew that something was in this group, all I would know about it was that I, in the past, considered them to be creepy crawly, which means that the group doesn't teach me anything about them that I didn't already know when I put them in that group. So this is called a polyphyletic group, uh, multiple phyla, essentially because common ancestry didn't even play into my decisions about who goes into this group. It's the worst kind of group because it doesn't teach you anything. Uh, all it is is a filing system 
or based on whatever characteristics it is that you liked. And so, so understanding these groups and how to determine their close relatives, this is going to be really important information uh, and an important skill for you to have. Let's see. There's a, let me make sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple things I'd like to talk about for sure. Um, so if you look at the skeleton of uh, the arm of a you, a human, you will discover that there's kind of a pattern to the bones. You're going to have uh, one bone up here called the humerus, uh, two bones here called the tibia and fibula, and then a whole bunch of hand bones. Those are, that's kind of the, the basic build of your arm. And, and interestingly enough, if you look at the arm of a cat, uh, well, I mean, the, the front leg of a cat, it's basically built the same way. One bone, two bones, many bones. And, you know, and that's not that shocking. It's probably more surprising when you look at, say, the wing of a bat, which is also built approximately the same way. Or the flipper of a whale. Uh, you've got all sorts of, of organisms that have one bone, two bones, many bones, even though they're not using those structures in similar ways at all, right? Like a whale's flipper is not like the uh, leg of a cat, is not like the wing of a bat, is not like the arm of a human, and yet they're all built in the same way structurally, which is pretty bizarre. Well, the a, a very reasonable explanation for this is that they're all so similar, not because of their function, because their functions are totally different. They're all so similar because they inherited those basic structures from their common ancestors. And so structures that are similar due to common ancestry, they are called homologous. H-O-M-O-L-O-G-O-U-S, uh, homologous structures. And these are kind of the polar opposite from situations that you'd see, say, with like the wing of a bat or the wing of a bird or the wing of a grasshopper uh, or the wing of a pterodactyl. In, in that case, you've got lots and lots of wings. And in many ways, they're very similar. But as far as the structure that's used to build them, completely different. They're completely different. I mean, not all of them have bones. Those that do have bones are using completely different bones. A pterodactyl, for example, has got three fingers that stick up high, just sort of normal fingers, and then one stupendously long pinky finger that makes up basically the whole wing. Uh, the word pterodactyl actually means, terra means wing, and dactyl means finger in Latin, so it's wing finger. And, uh, you know, for good reason, uh, a bat wing, is probably the most similar to that, but it's not even that similar because they've just got one one thumb that sticks up and then their fingers, all their fingers are stupendously long and webbed and that's their wing. A bird's wing, all of these bones are fused and then they've got feathers growing off of them. And then insect wings, um, they don't have any bones at all anywhere. And, and so all of these wings are built completely differently from one another. And, and the reality is these animals, they're not each other's closest relatives. These wings are similar due to function, but they are structurally very, very different. And so uh, structures that are similar because of shared function and not because of shared ancestry, these are called analogous or analogy. Uh, A-N-A-L-O-G-O-U-S, analogous structures. And analogous... Um, you know, an analogy is the same thing, right? It's, it's something that's different, but is functionally the same. So, you know, in, in literature or in, in biology, that's what analogy means. Okay, looking back to my slides real quick. Um, that actually covers pretty well, I think, the rest of what I wanted to talk about about phylogenetic trees. How about before I move on, though, what questions do you guys have about phylogenetic trees? While you're, while you're writing those, I'll also mention, if at any point you have questions, feel free to just ask them there in the chat. And, you know, even if I'm in the middle of something else and I don't see it right away, I will catch it. So I'll give you another minute or so to 
write out any questions. I'll, I'll actually, while you're doing that, I'll just take a peek at the next thing. Okay, well the next thing, and I, I already gave you some videos on this, um, about, oh yeah, analogous versus homologous, real quick, just the difference. Okay, so that is a great question because they're completely different things. And, and so make sure this is clear, and if, if this explanation doesn't work for you, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to explain it differently. Homologous structures are similar not because they have the same function. A lot of times they have very different functions. But they're similar because they were inherited from the same ancestors. Analogous structures are not similar because of shared ancestry. They're similar because of similar function. So they're the exact opposite of one another. Analogous are the same because of function, not because of ancestry. Homologous are the same because of ancestry, not because of function. Does that make sense? Giddy up. Okay. So um, when it comes to questions about the origin of life, uh, I, I gave you a pretty cool video about that. Most of what I want you to know, in fact, probably more than I'm going to ask you about on that question was in that video. But one thing I, I want to talk about just uh, really quickly is about the difficulty of that question. Uh, you know, th this is something you'll probably run into in your life is that this, this question of how life originated, people will be like, well, you know, you don't even know. Um, and the, the reality is we don't know. And I would say it's unlikely in our lifetime that we will know with a high degree of certainty how life originated. And, uh, there's very good reason for this. Uh, you know, evolution, which we've, we've talked about a lot already, is, is a pretty easy question to tackle, largely because it's ongoing. It's still happening today. We, we, you know, we can observe evolution occurring. There's a ton of fossil evidence for it. So, you know, we can go back a long, long way in the fossil record. We can, we can observe evidence of it in genetics and in morphology. Like, there's evidence for it all over the place. But the origin of life is an event that happened perhaps only one time several billion years ago, and it didn't fossilize. Not only because organisms like that don't fossilize well, but also because if in the moment that life originated, it died and was fossilized, there would be no life. And, and so there, there only can exist very limited evidence for exactly how life originated. Um, probably at best, what we can do is we can, well, we can look at the fossil record as far back as it goes. You know, as it goes back very, very far, life becomes extremely, extremely simple. And so, you know, single cells, really simple single cells, you know, so, so it appears that life started in a very uh, comparatively simple way compared to what life looks like now. Um, but, but in addition to that, you know, we can, we can look for clues as to what the early earth was like at about the time that we first start seeing signs of life. And, and we can see, you know, are there ways, you know, that life can originate? Uh, you know, we find, we find things like amino acids, and, and lipids and things can be uh, delivered by meteorites. And, you know, they're, they're, we can end up spontaneously generating organic compounds and things from, from these early conditions. And so we get an idea, you know, that oh, maybe, I mean, if you get some of this like self-replicating anything encapsulated in a tiny bubble, which these, these, uh, Newt's commander, hello. 
Are you the same one that comments on some of our other videos? Or are you just a good reptile person? Anyway, sorry. If you get if you get any of these tiny bubbles, these these that are called micro vesicles. Well, hot diggity! I didn't even know you were in the class. Well, uh, if you get any of these tiny little bubbles around any sort of um, organic molecules that are self-replicating, then bam, you've got the worst cell ever. And, and that's probably what we're looking at as far as the origin of life is, you know, you get these these worst cells in the history of cells and that was sort of the origin of life well you know as far as we know like this could happen every 50 days now i don't know but if it happened now you would have created the worst life form ever and it would have to compete immediately with life forms that have been evolving and getting awesome for the last several billion years and so they're not going to make it so you know maybe maybe this occurs all the time but we would never never notice it because they would just get out competed or eaten destroyed almost as soon as they formed because they suck and and so you know we're as far as understanding exactly how it happened we can come up with ways that it, it plausibly could happen and, and you know and we've got a lot of very good plausible hypotheses that we'll, we'll continue to test and they're going to get more and more plausible as time goes on but I mean, that certainly doesn't mean that that's the way that it did happen. And you know, this is this is sort of the, the the challenge of science. Some questions are easy to tackle, and some are hard. And the origin of life is a question that is pretty darn hard because the evidence is very limited. And if you guys remember back to feeling in the bag, it's just a a, a wide awake nightmare. This science thing. But um, today, today we've kind of got. What are often considered three groups, three kind of big groups of life. Now they they share common ancestors, and historically, uh, you would see these three groups classified as the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And historically, I mean, you'd see them kind of like this. So I got B for bacteria, E for eukarya, A for archaea. Uh, the archaea and the bacteria are all what you'd call prokaryotes, um, which is a dumb group. That's a that's a dumb name for a group. Uh, sort of. I mean, it's it's. Here's the deal. Uh, the prokaryotes being the bacteria and the archaea, the B and the A, you might notice that's not a monophyletic group. And in fact, it's even worse than this because it looks like archaea are actually not a monophyletic group either. It looks like eukarya sort of popped up in the middle of archaea. So archaea probably looks a little bit more like this with eukarya being just one of the lineages of archaea. Uh, and so the prokaryotes are definitely not a monophyletic group because the archaea are more closely related to the eukarya than they are to the bacteria. In fact, it's the case that probably a lot of the archaea are more closely related to the eukarya than they are to other archaeans. So, um, Prokarya is not a monophyletic group. The way I like to describe prokarya, so prokarya is a group for all uh, cellular life forms that are not eukaryotes. So in order to understand what they are, all you need to do is understand what makes the eukaryotes distinct and then say, well, they don't have that stuff. Uh, this is sort of like creating a, a group of people called the not bobs. And the, the not Bobs are everybody who's not named Bob, you know. And so, so I, in fact, a specific Bob. So I'll find this one specific Bob, and I'll find the things that make this one specific Bob Bob. And then I will say, well, uh, you know, the, the, the proto Bobs or the non Bobs, they are all united by not having the things that make Bob unique, which is kind of ridiculous. So. Eukaryotes, what they have that nobody else has is they have a true nucleus. 
uh, which essentially means that their DNA is surrounded by its own membrane, the nuclear envelope. And they've got other membrane-bound organelles, like the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, the Golgi apparatus, things like that. Uh, mitochondria, chloroplasts, these sorts of things that have their own membranes, organelles with their own membranes. The, the non-bobs don't have these. So, so the prokaryotes do not have a true nucleus, and they do not have membrane-bound organelles. They're united by not being eukaryotes, and that's it. Because the archaea are actually more similar uh, to the eukaryotes than they are to the bacteria, um, which, is, which is important to note. But they're both prokaryotes because neither of them are eukaryotes. Hooray. They're all non-bobs. Um, so let's see. Let's see. Um, you, you guys watched pretty good videos about the bacteria and the archaea and the eukarya. What, what questions do you have about them? And I'm going to look at your study guide just to make sure there's nothing from this week that I haven't talked. Oh, yeah, I haven't talked about the protests yet. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing any specific questions about this. The, the, these things I'm only going over very superficial. Okay. How would this show on a test? Well, I mean, there. I. I think there's still going to be multiple true/false on my questions, and so I would just ask you something about the prokaryotes or the bacteria, the archaea, and I would ask, is this true or is this false? Um, oh, what is the name for the group with all three of them? Cellular life. So all, all three of these things together are cellular life. This is all life forms except for viruses, which are only sort of arguably alive. Speaking of that, I gave you guys uh, a video that kind of talks about, you know, what is life, because that's another important thing to make sure you understand. Um, and, and viruses, um, they don't really quite fit that description of, of what, what is a life form. Now, you know, and this is, this is particularly relevant to us right now, because we are all dealing with a virus. But, but viruses, one of the things they can't do is, well, they can't reproduce on their own. And they're not made of cells, so they're not cellular life. Huh. Well, Newt, welcome to class. That makes more sense. I didn't even know that this stream was uh, a live stream. So, yes, uh, so all the videos were in the last announcement that I gave. I, I put out an announcement, and uh, and in that announcement, I have uh, links to all of the videos that are relevant. Yeah, sorry, Newt. I, uh, uh, th this is our class. We're, we're having to move online for the foreseeable future. And so uh, I, I created this. It was supposed to be unlisted, but I've had some technical difficulties. So if it wound up listed, that doesn't shock me at all. Yeah, I've changed the link out, Steve, so that...
So there, there should be the new link now. But just as well, I guess. Welcome to all of you who are not actually in Bio 1010. I don't know if there's anybody like that. Fortunately, this is on my no-name uh, personal YouTube page and not not my other page, but we'd have a ton of people in here. <laughs> and there'd be all kinds of questions about reptiles. And people are like, I thought the live stream was Friday. Perfect. Okay, well, um, I think if you've, if you've watched the videos, I'm really glad we got to do the flippy mapping before we had to switch to this. Um, that, that, the, between, between, so between those videos and, and what we've discussed today, I think that's most of the content. But I'm going to hang out for questions for as long as you guys have questions. So keep asking. And, and next time I'll get started right on time and won't have any uh, technical difficulties, hopefully. Is exam three next Thursday? Let me take a look at the, our syllabus. I'm going to try to get it, try to get back on schedule with our syllabus, which just means I'm not going to put as much material on the exam, which is going to be nice for everyone. Okay. My computer's not fast, but it's from 2009, and I think it's holding up all right. Okay. Uh, let's see here, Richard. Well, let's see. So as far as next Thursday, I don't think it'll be next Thursday. Um, let me get back into the live stream. Because I'm going to have to, I'll give you plants next week. And I'm going to want to have this live stream open. So I would say the following Tuesday, not the soonest. Um, but I'll, I'll have to plan that. So, okay, let's see here. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, as far as a soft polytomy goes, no. Uh, the main thing with a polytomy is that sometimes, so, so the simplest of all phylogenetic trees will have three organisms at least. So to be the simplest, it'll have three. And it'll show, you know, the which ones are most closely related to each other. At times, I don't have enough evidence to say that, say, A and C are more closely related to each other than they are to B. I know that the three of them are related, but I don't know. I don't know which two are the closest relatives. And so I don't ever, on a phylogeny, I don't ever make a statement with my phylogeny that isn't backed up by some evidence. And so if I don't have evidence to tell you which of those two are the most similar to each other, I will just show you like this, that I know they're related. I don't know which two are closest. And that's called a polytomy. They called it a soft polytomy in that video. And that's really it. I mean, that it, two of these are more closely related to each other than they are to the other one. But I don't have enough evidence to say which one that is. And so I'm not going to just throw up a hypothesis. Uh, well, I'm not going to throw up a completely uninformed hypothesis. I'm just going to say we need to look into this question more. Um, you're welcome. Let's see, sounds good. 
have, have a good time at work, Kevin. Yeah. Oh, and I saw somebody asking when the next time will be. I, I'm going to do this every Thursday, every Thursday at this exact same time. And uh, as far as missing the first half an hour, you actually only ended up missing like the first 15 minutes because I had some technical difficulties. And so uh, this will be available to rewatch. So it, I think once the stream ends, you can probably use this same link to watch it again or or at least uh, come back to this channel and uh, I'll make sure that the video is available to watch. I'll, I'll, I'll make it public so that people who have no idea what this is about can watch too. That'll be great. Um, perfect, thanks. Uh, I haven't talked about the dark reaction because we haven't, we haven't begun to talk about that. I gave you the entire uh, review for the next exam. That way, if you want to study on your own ahead of time, you can. Uh, I'll give you some videos about photosynthesis in the coming week, and then we'll talk about it next Thursday as well. Any other questions? Um, so on Tuesdays, I'm going to try to make sure that you have all the new videos and content. So I'm going to do the, I'll do these live streams on Thursdays so I can answer your questions. I'm going to try to make sure you have all the content you're going to need. Like I said, you've already got the review guide. So if, if you want to get ahead, you can start studying in your book and looking for videos yourself on a lot of these things. I'll also try to get you some good videos and, and other sources of content. And then on Thursday, we'll discuss it. So Tuesdays, I'll make sure you have the content. Thursdays, we'll do this. Uh, as far as time for the exams, I'm definitely going to have them timed because I don't want you just to you know, spend a week uh, researching and stuff in your book. I still need you to, to study and know the material in advance, but you can reference your books. Um, so I would say, as of right now, plan on having about the same amount of time that you have for the in when we were doing them in class. So that'd be like an hour and 15 minutes. What other questions do you guys have? All right. Have a good time at work. Stay socially distanced as best you can. Welcome. This is a pretty crazy time, is it not? Thank you guys for being so patient with me. The tree model you showed originally. No, 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 no they're related. Yeah. It's a good, okay, so, so the question, if you're not seeing it, says with the tree model you showed originally, the only way we could know if they were related is based upon the information given. And that's a question. Yes. Could you please explain uh, why? Could you explain, I think, why one is closer related to a certain branch? Okay. Okay. So I've drawn this, this phylogeny. Um, this is the very beginning. If you, we always start there. We start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. Okay, so that's the beginning. All of these, A, E, D, C, and B, those are all the end of this story. So I start here, and this is some sort of a population of organisms. 
they continued on, probably changing considerably through time, but not changing in different directions. Uh, what I'm getting is like directional selection or maybe one population that gets separated off into a different environment. And so eventually there was a split and they went in two different ways, not directional selection, sorry, uh, uh, disruptive selection. Uh, and so what I, what I have is I have a split where the population is going off in two different directions. And, and one of these lineage, lineages eventually becomes C and B and the other becomes A, E, and D. This is the, the first split that ever happened in this population, at least that we know of. And so this split occurred. And as a result of the fact that these ancestors here are only shared by C and B, and these ancestors here are only shared by A, E, and D, B, C and B are more closely related to each other than they are to A, E, and D, and A, E, and D are more closely related to each other than they are to C and B. Uh, because these guys share ancestors until fairly recently, whereas they only share ancestors with A, E, and D a long time ago. And so there's only really one good way to figure out who the closest relatives are. And so, like, if I wanted to know who the closest relative is of C, I would just go, okay, well, what was the last time that C shares an ancestor with anybody else? And it would be here. And then I go, okay, with whom does it share that ancestor? Uh, it shares it with B and B only. So the most recent time that C shared an ancestor with anybody, it shared it with B. And so the closest living relative to B or to C is B. If I wanted to know the same thing for A here, I would do the same thing. I go, okay, well, what was the last time that A shared common ancestors with anybody else? And that would be right here at this node. And it shares that common ancestor with both E and D. Now you'll notice I've drawn E on the right. And I drew E on the right and D on the left because I did. Had I drawn D on the left and E on the right, or sorry, if I'd drawn the, them the opposite, if I'd drawn D on the right and E on the left, that would have been different because then D would have been on the right and E would have been on the left. But the story would have been exactly the same. And so it, it wouldn't have changed anything. It's just I can flip these nodes around. It doesn't change the story at all. But I do notice that the last time that it shared a common ancestor with anybody, it shared it with both E and D. And because there was no difference between E and D, when the ancestors of A split away from the ancestors of E and D, it's not more closely related to one than it is the other. It's equally related to both E and D. E and D are the closest living relatives of A. Uh, did that answer your question? And if you have more questions, feel free to ask them. Perfect. Yeah, I can go over mutation. Okay, yeah, and I'll go over this real quick. So, yes, E and D, they're each other's closest relatives. Because if I go, okay, well, when was the last time that D shared a common ancestor with anybody? I'd go back to here. And it shares that ancestor with E, uh, but not with anybody else. So its closest relative is E. It does share common ancestors with A, but it's a more distant common ancestor. This is sort of like you share common ancestors with your with your first cousins, your grandparents, but you don't share as close uh, as recent of common ancestors with your with your first cousins as you do with your siblings. So you're more closely related to your siblings than you are your first cousins. Because uh, I go over mutation. Yeah, I can go to mutation. So uh, feel free to ask follow-up questions because there's a lot of different things we could discuss as far as mutation goes. But but what a mutation is is a it's a change in the genetic material. Um, the, these changes can occur either because of errors during uh, the copying of genetic material, or because the DNA gets broken somehow. Um, and then during the repair process, it gets, um, well, fixed wrong by the angry guy. And so it ends up uh, having a, a different message. And now when I do transcription and translation, I end up making a different protein product than I did before. The real question is, 
how different will that protein product be? And this can depend a lot on the type of mutation that occurs. If one of my nucleotides in my string of nucleotides just gets swapped for a different one, it's going to change one triplet codon. And a change of one triplet codon is going to result in one different amino acid. I mean, it, it could be worse, but you know, because it could become a stop codon where the protein just ends. But usually it'll just swap out one amino acid. And as a result, um, my protein is a little bit different. However, if I get what's called an insertion or a deletion where it adds an, a nucleotide, suddenly that's going to change every, it's going to cause what's called a frame shift, and it's going to change every single triplet codon from that point on. And that's going to change my protein product big time. Did that answer your question? Uh, and I'm also ready for more. If you guys have more questions, keep them coming. Hot diggity. Is this helpful? I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to come up with the best way to help you guys because online classes are not the way to go. Uh, I mean, sometimes, sometimes out of necessity, they're the way to go, but it is harder to do well in online classes. So I'm, I'm going to try to be as, as actually there for you guys as I can be. I think I think one of the biggest things. Okay, here I got a question. Who? Um, what is the what are the major differences between the bacteria and the archaea? Um, as far as things I'm gonna hold you accountable for, um, not too much, not too much. I the main thing that I want you to know is that the archaea are actually in ways that we're not even really digging into. They're more similar to the eukarya than they are to the bacteria. I'm not, I'm not making us get way, way into detail on this. Um, there's actually pretty good information on it in the videos that, that I posted. That's probably more detail than I'm, I'm even going to test you on. But uh, if you're just interested in, in how they're different, there, there's a really good description there. Um, Oh, can I can I ask you guys a question? Um, so so online classes, the people do worse. People do worse. My my uh, uh, PhD graduate advisor, she BYU wants to move uh, it so that every every student has to take one full semester of online classes. And this is because BYU's campus isn't allowed to get any larger, and so this would allow them to take on more students. And, but she studied performance, and they do one full letter grade worse in online classes than they do in live classes. Uh, and I, I think I think part of it is an online class is a lot easier to just sort of put on the back burner, be like, oh, I'll do it later because I can do it whenever. And it really, it, you know, it kicks them in the butt then. So, so I'm going to try to make this as real as I can for you guys because I want to see you succeed. You guys were doing great. You guys are doing great in this class, and I. I mean, honestly, that I didn't, I didn't even get to say goodbye to most of you. You know, the, the last night that I had the evening class, I, you know, I, I at least knew, you know, this is probably it. And I was so sad because we're just getting to the part of the parts of the year where we can have some really great discussions. And, you know, you, you guys have all the foundation you need to, to understand some really cool stuff. So I'm glad we have a way to still have some quasi face to face interaction like this. Um, my, my question for you guys, uh, First off, you know what? What? what and I'll, I'll try to write these things down. You know what? What? What do you think I could be doing to help you guys succeed, um, given our, our current circumstances? And and also, uh, in any of your other classes, are there things that your other instructors are doing that would be uh, helpful if, if I did them as well? So if you wanna if you wanna throw out any suggestions like that, I'd love it. And also, if you have other questions about the material, I'm open to that as well. And also, if you... Uh 
if you don't have any further questions, I do think we've gone over most of the content for this week. Just make sure make sure you've gone over those videos and that you're understanding them. And I, you can ask me questions about this week's stuff next week as well. Um, but you are also free to go whenever you like. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much. I'll try to I'll try to be as helpful as I can. Thank you. This is awesome feedback. It's making me, making me feel excited about what we can do because I feel bad that it's not face to face. Well, thank you. Let's see. So uh, Google Hangouts. Okay, so that that is one where you all the faces of the people talking pop up. Is that correct? I, I use Google Hangouts some. Would that be more useful than this? I, I'm 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 more comfortable with with YouTube, but um, but I it is nice having the faces. If you guys would like that, maybe we'll switch eventually. So yeah, we'll Google. I'll write that down as something to consider. And I'll play with that. Sometimes I'm involved in these Google Hangouts uh, conversations. I think I'd have to see if I can record them so that people who can't be there on time can still see it. Uh, I agree, uh, uh, Simone. I, I'm, you know, there, there's, there's probably more information in those videos than you need. I'm, I'm screening a lot of videos and I'm making sure that they at least talk about the points that I think are important. In some cases, it's gonna be overkill and feel free to clarify exactly what I wanted you to get out of each one in these discussions. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to find videos that aren't so over the top and that they're not super long. You know, sometimes it's like, there's a great video, but it's an hour long. And so I'm like trying to find videos that are like five minutes long. And, um, and so, you know, hopefully, I, I, guess, I guess I think it's better for you to know too much than too little. And so hopefully if you knew more than you needed to know and then the test seems easy, that's better than not knowing enough. But I'm, uh, I, wish, I wish I had more time to make all the videos myself. Um, but I, this is a funny thing, but by myself, I actually really suck at making videos. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll do the best I can to find ones that aren't too, too over the top. Okay, so so yeah, uh, then I'll, I'll have to find out if there's any way to rewatch the Google Hangouts conversations, but I don't I don't know of one. I'm sure it's doable. I'm just not actually great with technology, so um, I'll play with that. But this I'm actually really happy with how this is working so far. So let's see here. Mm. Oh yeah, so I I I actually use Zoom. I I teach some classes. Uh, they're UVU classes, that, but I teach them for. Uh, 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 charter high school that that does concurrent enrollment and I use zoom for those and, and zoom is uh, It's great. It actually gives me more tools than this does because I can show the PowerPoints and things like that the biggest pain to zoom is that um, You guys would all have to have zoom accounts and stuff, but I can I can consider I mean, I, I know how to use the zoom technology So we could consider that Microsoft Teams can be recorded. I'll look up Microsoft Teams. Hmm. I'll have to look that up. Ah, that would definitely kill Google Hangouts if that's true. Uh, it looks like Google Hangouts is not our best bet. Zoom is pretty good because we can record it. 
and I know how to use it, but you just have to get your own accounts. That might be the same thing for Microsoft Teams. Uh, so, so for now, at least for next Thursday, uh, probably count on this. Um, and then if there's going to be changes in the future, I'll, I'll let you all know about that. And I'm still here for more questions if you have them. And always remember, when watching these streams, you can watch them uh, at faster than than uh, real time speed. So if you if you're in a hurry, you can speed through a lot of it that you don't need to watch, and then slow it way down for the parts that you do. You can record Zoom as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, it sounds like both of those are pretty good. As far as having a, a built-in whiteboard, I don't know how useful that is. I'm not great at drawing with my mouse. <laughs> I'll use a real whiteboard and hold it up here. Hi, guys. But I'll, I will look into both of those, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. We can play with this. Okay. Well, unless you guys have any other questions, uh, it looks like we've we've come to the end. I really appreciate these these suggestions because they're good ones, and I'll, I'll definitely I want to find the best the best possible way to do this. This I I think has been pretty good. Um, I've actually been really happy with it, but it doesn't allow me to show you my slides. But some of my slides are pretty cool, so. We might, we might, we might play with Zoom in the future. Um, short term, though, through next week, I think we're going to be okay just on here. So, so plan, plan on this for next week, and if, uh, you know, if uh, we end up switching over, I'll try to walk you through it. Thank you guys, thank you guys so much for your time, and I'll, I'll stick, I'll stick around until uh, for like three more minutes. Until until this hits exactly an hour. So if you have if you have other questions, don't panic. I'll I'll stay here until you guys are all done. But uh, I think I think we're done. So you're all free to go. And you're welcome.
All right, see you next time.